Hello, this is Dr. Gardner. We're going to continue from our discussion from last time with looking at Boyle's Law again as a review. If you remember, Boyle's Law stated that pressure was in, inversely related to volume. Now, if I want to replace the proportionality sign here that says pressure is inversely related to the volume, we could go ahead and say that pressure times volume is equal to a constant. All I did was multiply both sides of our relationship here by volume. And to put an equal sign in here, we had to determine a constant. Right now, we're not going to worry about that constant, but we will be using it later on uh, in a different form in the course. Now, if we realize pressure could be written as equal to the constant times 1 over volume, or volume could be written to the constant as 1 over pressure, we have two potential equations that we could use to relate pressures to volumes. But sometimes we might want to consider when we have changing conditions. So let's say we have pressure 1 and volume 1 equal to our constant. Uh, and then let's say under a second set of conditions we have a pressure 2 times a volume 2 under the second set of conditions is still equal to that same constant. Now this constant value would be the same in both cases, of course, which is why we defined it as a constant. Uh, I could set these two equations equal to one another. If I did so, we generate the bottom equation on this page. And since the constants are equal to one another, uh, we can go ahead when we set pressure and volume 1 equal to pressure 2 and volume 2, we can exclude the constant. So we have a very useful equation when we have changing conditions. Now this equation can only be used if we're keeping temperature constant and the numbers of moles of gas constant. But it's a very useful equation whenever we have changing pressures and volumes uh, in these types of circumstances with no other variable related to the gas changing. Let's try applying this equation. If we go ahead and have a gas sample uh, that's 2 liters in volume, and it's going to decrease from 1.2 atmospheres in pressure to 0 0.25 atmospheres in pressure at a constant temperature, and with a constant number of moles of gas, let's go ahead and find the new volume. Since I'm keeping the temperature constant and the, vol and the amount of gas in moles constant in this case, because we did not say that we lost any gas and we didn't gain any extra gas, we can go ahead and use the equation we had defined previously that the initial pressures and volumes multiplied by one another would be equal to the final pressure and volumes multiplied by one another. So what's useful here is then to uh, go ahead and define my variables. So I can go ahead and say, well, my initial pressure one was 2.50 atmospheres. Uh, actually, I think we worked that last problem last time, so we're working a very similar question here. So we want to say, okay, what pressure is needed to compress 455 milliliters of oxygen gas? at 2.50 atmospheres to a volume of 282 milliliters. Uh, we did work the, that last problem last time, so I'm going to work on this one this time. Uh, with respect to this, we go ahead and say that the initial pressure was 2.50 atmospheres, and my initial volume was 455 milliliters. What I don't know is what the final pressure would be in order for the volume of gas to be reduced to 282 milliliters. Since I have an inverse relationship with pressure and volume, I should have a decreasing uh, volume as the pressure would increase. So I'm predicting I'm going to get a larger pressure value. So the equation I'm using if we're keeping temperature constant and the number of moles constant is pressure 1 times volume 1. So those are my initial conditions would be equal to pressure 2 times volume 2. Okay. In this circumstance, we want to solve for pressure 2. So I divide by both sides of the equation by volume 2. Uh, so I end up with P1V1 over V2 is equal to my pressure 2 that I'm trying to solve for. So if we plug in all of our variables from our defined equations, our final pressure would have to be equivalent to the initial pressure of 2.5 atmospheres times the initial volume of 4.55 milliliters divided by the final volume of 282 milliliters. This will then give me a pressure 2 that's equivalent to 4.03 atmospheres. So we'd have to increase the pressure from 2.5 atmospheres up to 4.03 atmospheres in order for the volume to be decreased for the volume of gas from 455 milliliters to the 282 milliliters. Now the most common mistakes I see students perform with a problem like this is they mistakenly swap the two volumes since they have the same units. So you need to very carefully define that your volume initial was the 455 milliliters and your volume final was the 282 milliliters and be careful not to swap those two values. Of course if you had you would have ended up with a lower 
pressure, and you should have predicted that doesn't make sense to have a decreasing volume with a lowering pressure because they should have an inverse relationship from our understanding of Boyle's law. Now let's see how this works with respect to shipping products. So if we're shipping products uh, in the U.S. and we're shipping a product from one elevation to another, we might notice that uh, the amount of gas trapped inside of our bags for our products could potentially change with respect to volumes as the surrounding atmospheric pressure changes. Okay, so let's consider if we go ahead and were to pack a bag of chips at uh, let's say sea level and ship it to a higher elevation the gas in the bag could expand and you could end up with a puffier bag of chips or if you were to ship it to a slower uh, altitude we'd end up with a greater atmospheric pressure and we'd end up with a smaller volume of air in the bag of chips so we actually can have variable volumes in our bags of chips and we'd have to account for that with respect to the size of our bags and any free space because if you did not and you were shipping to a lower pressure higher elevation your chip bag could potentially rupture and if you didn't take this into account as well when you ship to a lower elevation well potentially your bags uh, could deflate enough that there would be more damage to chips in shipment Okay, so that's something we have to think about. So that lower atmospheric pressure at higher elevation causes the particles of gas to spread out and occupy that larger volume. That's what would make the bag of chips uh, expand slightly, because not because there's any more gas in there, but because that gas is taking up a larger volume. Okay, now this can relate uh, to other changes as well. So far with Boyle's law, we've only been looking at volume changes with pressure. Now let's consider if we're not holding temperature constant. If we have temperature changes, well, the volumes of our gases can also change. So let's consider that we have a balloon filled full of air, so we have nitrogen and oxygen gas as the main components. If we were to cool that balloon down, let's say we were to put liquid nitrogen on the balloon. Now my liquid nitrogen has a temperature of about 77 Kelvin, or negative 196 degrees Celsius. As we lower the temperature from room temperature to the much lower temperature by putting liquid nitrogen on our balloons, the volume of the gas would decrease. So what we're finding is as temperature decreases, volumes of gases decrease. So we have a proportional relationship between the two. Okay. If I were to increase temperature, my volume would also increase. So if I were to take the balloon that had uh, liquid nitrogen poured on it and allow it to warm back up to room temperature, the volume of the gas would increase again and re-expand the balloon. Uh, I'd already asked you to watch a video uh, from MIT where they were looking at balloon animals being put in liquid nitrogen. So hopefully you watched that video. If not, that would be a good time to pause now and watch the video related to Charles' law. So what we're seeing with this relationship that we call Charles' law is that volume is directly proportional to temperature. Okay, So if I divided both sides of this equation by temperature, I could relate it to a constant. So volume divided by temperature would be related to a constant. And I could solve for either volume or temperature if I wanted to divide the other side by the second, or multiply the other side by the second variable. If I have a set of changing conditions, similar to what we did with Boyle's Law, we can go ahead and say, well, we have conditions 1 for volume and conditions 1 for temperature equal to a constant, but I would also have conditions 2 and 2 related to that same constant. So I could go ahead and relate, under changing conditions, the initial volumes and temperatures to the final volumes and temperatures by writing the following equation. Now I could solve for any of my unknown variables. Now I want you to notice that when we're working with temperature in this equation, we should put our uh, values in, in Kelvin and not in Celsius. We do not want to use negative values for our temperatures for making predictions uh, because if we're looking at what's happening with changing volumes, we want to consider that our temperature is going to always be a positive value on the Kelvin scale, whereas the Celsius scale we will get these negative values which in calculations potentially could give you unreasonable results for volumes. Okay, So we're always going to be working with the Kelvin scale on the bottom, do not use the Celsius scale. So what we're going to find is as we have increasing temperature in Kelvin, uh, we will have increasing volumes in a linear relationship. Okay, so let's work a problem related to this. Let's look at a sample of carbon monoxide gas that's occupying 150 milliliters at 25 degrees Celsius. We're going to go hold and have a go ahead and have a constant pressure. So we're holding the pressure constant. We're also going to assume that the moles of gas are constant in this case. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and cool down the sample. Uh, 
and then we're going to find that the volume change as I cool the sample will change from 150 milliliters to 100 milliliters. So what I'm really interested in is how low would the new temperature have to be in Celsius in order for my volume to have decreased by those 50 milliliters. So it's going to be below 25 degrees Celsius. Now, however, I warned you that we should be working with temperature in Kelvin. So I'm going to convert my temperatures to Kelvin to begin with, solve for my answer in Kelvin, and then convert back to Celsius at the end of the problem. So I want to work in Kelvin with these problems. Okay, so I went ahead and defined what I had for temperature 1. So the initial temperature was 25 degrees Celsius. I added 273.15 to convert to Kelvin. So I end up with my temperature 1 being 298.2 Kelvin for the temperature. Now if I want to solve for temperature 2, I'm going to have to go ahead and use Charles Law to solve this problem. And so my volume 1 was 150 milliliters. My temperature 1 in Kelvin, we just calculated, was 298.2. My volume 2 was only 100 milliliters. And I want to solve for temperature 2. So I'm using Charles' law with changing conditions. So I have volume 1 over temperature 1 is equal to volume 2 over temperature 2. Now what we can see if we want to solve for temperature 2, we can go ahead and multiply both sides of the equation by temperature 2. And then we can multiply both sides of the equation by temperature 1 and divide both sides of the equation by my volume 1. So we should end up with volume 1 here in the denominator. Okay. Now what we could see then when we plug everything into our equation, we're going to end up with uh, my final volume being 100 milliliters, my initial temperature being 298.2 Kelvin, and my initial volume being 150 milliliters. Now sometimes I see students swap the two volumes, so make sure that algebraically you've kept track of everything and that you carefully defined your, your um, initial volumes and your final volume so you don't have those inverted. However, we were predicting a lower temperature, so if you had inverted it, you would end up with a higher temperature and you should hopefully catch your error before submitting an answer on homework or an exam. Uh, now if we take the 100 milliliters times the initial temperature divided by the uh, initial volume, we end up with 198.8 Kelvin, which makes sense because we would have to cool the temperature down. Now this is in Kelvin, so we're going to want to convert that to Celsius. So to convert that to Celsius, we take the 198.8 Kelvin, subtract 273.15, we end up with a negative 74.4 degrees Celsius. So we have to have a pretty significant decrease in temperature for the volume to decrease by 50 milliliters in this case. So we don't always see uh, with room temperature changes large volumes of changes of gases. However, if we start to look at larger changes in temperature, then the volumes of gases changing could be significant. Now let's assume we had a balloon that was filled with air that has a volume of 15.0 liters at 25 degrees Celsius. We would like to find the volume of this same amount of air at negative 100 degrees Celsius. So let's go ahead and assume that we have a constant uh, pressure in this case and the numbers of moles of gas are not changing. If that's the situation, we can go ahead and set up this problem with respect to uh, Charles' law. I went ahead with the changing set of conditions for Charles' law. I solved for volume 2 again. So my volume 2 is going to be equal to volume 1 divided by temperature 1 times temperature 2. Make sure you're not uh, mixing up your two temperatures in this case. And so my volume 2 will be equal to 15.0 liters, so that was my initial volume of the gas, divided by my initial temperature of the 298.15 Kelvin. Now I know that because I added 273.15 to my temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. Now, since my volume at the end of this, or sorry, my temperature at the end of this process is negative 100 degrees Celsius. I also need to convert it to Kelvin. So I added 273.15 to end up with a value of 173.15 Kelvin. Now my Kelvins will cancel. I'll end up with my volume in liters. So I end up with 8.71 liters for the final volume. This makes sense. I had a pretty significant decrease in temperature. So we can see that the volume uh, had a pretty significant decrease in volume as well. So that follows, follows Charles' law. We expect that they would be directly proportional. Now, the next gas law I'd like to look at is the combined gas law. The combined gas law is going to combine Charles' law as well as Boyle's law. So we're going to have changing volumes, changing temperatures, and changing pressures. But the moles of gas, the amount of gas we have, will not be changing with respect to the number of particles. So if I look at this combined, well, I knew that volume was inversely proportional with respect to Boyle's law, right? So Boyle's law was volume 
It's inversely proportional to pressure. If we looked at Charles' law, we were saying that my volume was directly proportional to temperature. So all we've done is combine these two laws. So I'm saying volume is inversely proportional to pressure. So I'm still dividing by pressure on the other side of the proportionality. And then I can say volume is directly proportional to temperature. So I'm still uh, saying that volume is proportional to temperature on the other side of the proportionality symbol. Now if I have one set of conditions, well, what I can do is I can go ahead and write this equation. And I can say uh, that my initial pressure times my initial volume over my initial temperature is equal to a constant. Let's say this constant is just a k. Okay, well, I can say that constant's also equal to a second set of conditions with a second final pressure, a second final volume, and a second final temperature. If that's the case, I can say that, that the, sorry, this should be a 2, that your initial conditions would be equal to your final conditions when I set up the equation this way related to that constant. So that's where I can rewrite the combined gas law which we'll be using in lab for the gas laws lab. Okay, so in this situation I have an equation that I can use. So let's go ahead and apply the combined gas law equation. Just combines Charles law and Boyle's law here. And let's look at a sample of um, hydrogen gas that occupies uh, 1.25 liters at a temperature of 80.0 degrees Celsius and at a pressure of 2.75 atmospheres. Let's go ahead and decide what volume that this gas would occupy at 185 degrees Celsius and 5 atmospheres. So now we have uh, my changing, changing volume, my changing uh, temperature, and my changing pressure. We're told that we have the final temperature, final pressure, but we need to solve for that final volume. So I, first of all, I want to convert my temperatures to Kelvin before I use the combined gas law. So I'll have 80 degrees Celsius add to 73.15 Kelvin. That gets me 353.2 Kelvin. So I want to work with Kelvin in these equations. And then my final temperature is 185 degrees Celsius add to 73.15 Kelvin. We end up with 458 Kelvin. So I'm just converting temperatures from Celsius to Kelvin here. Now once I have those, let's define all of our variables. Well, my initial volume was 1.25 liters, my initial temperature was 353.2 Kelvin, and my initial pressure was 2.75 atmospheres. My final volume is unknown, but my t final temperature is 454 Kelvin. Now if I think about that, I'm increasing my temperature. So that would result in an increase in volume. So we expect that volume would start to increase from this first change. Okay, of, of temperature. However, if we look at pressure, well, my pressure is increasing. And since volume is inversely proportional to pressure, that would cause a decrease in volume. So I need to see which one of these changes is significant enough to win out in this situation. Okay, so I went ahead here, and I've just rewritten all of our defined variables. We're using the combined gas law equation, okay, since I have changing pressures, volumes, and temperatures in this case. And so we can go ahead and say if we're going to solve for volume 2, the volume 2 is equal to my pressure 1 times my volume 1 times my final temperature divided by my final, uh, sorry, my initial temperature here, and divided by my final pressure. Okay. So if I go ahead and set up my equation then, I can say that my pressure 1 is initially is going to be um, equal in this case to 2.75 atmospheres. So I put in P1 here. All right. So there's my 2.75 atmospheres. And then my volume initial was the 1.25 liters. So I go ahead and put in the 1.25 liters here my initial volume and then my final temperature was the 4.58 Kelvin okay and then you can see that my when I divide by the initial temperature that was the 353.2 Kelvin so you see how useful it was that we defined all of our variables as we get more of them okay so hopefully you find that useful and then I divided by that value and then I'm also dividing by my final pressure of five atmospheres so I'm dividing by the five atmospheres that allows me to calculate that the final uh, volume for my gas sample is 0 0.891 liters. 
Okay, so I can see that in this case, even though I increased temperature, which would have increased the volume, that the increasing pressure, which would decrease the volume, caused a more uh, significant change because we ended up going from 1.25 liters to a final volume of the 0 0.891. Liters in the end of this process. Okay, so with this in mind, I'd like your class to go ahead and use the combined gas law to try to solve the following problem. Okay, so if you have a plane that you're going to board, and let's say that you have a bag that's been loaded onto the plane uh, that had a sticky hair gel that you use. Okay, well, unfortunately, that you find after your flight that the hair gel had opened up and made a big mess in your bag. Uh, so let's think about what's happening with respect to the gases in your hair gel container. Well, what we're going to be looking at is in the plane, we might end up with the changing pressure and temperature conditions with respect to when you loaded the bag versus when the bag's in the cargo of the plane, well, you might cause the flip top cap to open up sometimes. Okay, so let's consider if the volume of the air inside the bottle is 125 milliliters at sea level. So let's assume at sea level that our, we have about one atmosphere of pressure, which in millimeters of mercury would be 760 millimeters of mercury. Now, uh, we loaded, let's say, our baggage on a cold day and sitting out uh, on the luggage carts to load onto the plane, let's say the temperature was about zero degrees Celsius. Okay, let's go ahead and decide then what volume the air would occupy in the bottle in the airplane if the cabin is heated to 20 degrees Celsius. So we're going to warm up the hair gel bottle and that the pressure would be 595 millimeters of mercury. Okay, so I'd like you to go ahead and pause the video and for the rest of today I'd like you to go ahead and work on solving this problem with your local instructor. Okay, with my next video I will give you the key to this problem. Okay, thank you very much.